special Chats with Champions. Our uh, Chats, as you know, is a free community service, and we are sponsored by you, our, our people in the community, and also by the, uh, Sherman's Main Coast Book Cafe and Store. Um, we're very grateful today, particularly to our friends at the Lincoln Theater, and welcome to this historic Lincoln Theater. If you haven't been here before, you need to get some information downstairs before you leave and come back. Uh, Senator Mitchell, who is our wonderful guest today, has a very long and distinguished career. He is really a son of Maine. He served for several years, uh, recently, more recently, as, as chairman of DLA Piper, and is now chairman emeritus. Before that, he served as a federal judge, our Maine senator for 15 years, and for six of those years as the majority leader of the United States Senate. He was known for being able to work across the aisles. Um, he's, also <laughs> he also served as chairman of the peace, peace negotiations in Northern Ireland, which resulted, as you all know, in an agreement that ended a historic conflict, and most recently has served as the U.S. Special Envoy to the Middle East. In 2008 Time Magazine, he was described as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. He's chairman of the board of the Walt Disney Company and serves as the director of several companies. Most importantly, he's a member of the board of the Boston Red Sox. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Mitchell is the author of five books. His most recent books are a memoir entitled The Negotiator, Reflections on an American Life, which was published in May of 2015, and A Path to Peace, which was published in November 2016. He will be signing both of these books immediately following his presentation here, back over at the library, where it will be set up. Um, we also want to welcome you to our next chat's uh, presentation, which will be a week from today, the 20th, at a different time than normal, which would be at noon, and the speaker will be Christina Baker Klein. Please join the Cats, Chats committees, get out to the library, Lincoln Theater, the bookstore, and now all everybody in <laughs> welcoming Senator George Mitchell. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for your warm reception. And thank you, Sharon, for your very generous introduction. Uh, my thanks to the Skidunka Library for inviting me here. I, uh, I do speak often, and I speak as often as possible in support of local libraries. They perform a very important function in our society at a time when fewer and fewer people are reading uh, uh, to remind people of the importance and enormous benefit uh, of the literary life. So, uh, you know, it's a great institution. I'm pleased here uh, to express my strong support for them and to thank you uh, for your support of the support library. Uh, as I said, I do speak often, uh, and uh, I've heard myself talk so much that for me, frankly, the highlight of the program is the introduction. <laughs> Thank Karen for doing such a nice job on that. It's always pleasant, of course, to hear good things said about you, especially from a group of primarily strangers uh, who don't really know you. Uh, uh, but there's a risk to it. And the risk, of course, is that uh, if you hear it often enough, you might begin to believe it. <laughs> so I, uh, I'd like to begin with a story about introductions and an occasion on which I was uh, brought back down to earth. Uh, I spent uh, uh, a total of five years working on the peace process in Northern Ireland. I chaired three <coughs> separate sets of negotiations during that time, and when uh, we ultimately were successful, I returned to my home. I have a home up on Mount Desert Island, 
and I wrote a book about that experience. When it was published, uh, I went on a tour around the country to promote sales. Uh, I received many invitations, and in the process I learned the interesting fact that in the United States there are more Irish American organizations than there are Irish Americans. <laughs> Every one of them sent me a letter wanting me to come, because I couldn't go to all of them, but I did go to many. And as I traveled all across the United States uh, speaking to these Irish American groups, they developed among them an informal competition as to who could give the longest, most fulsome, fantastic, sometimes truly ridiculous introduction to them. Uh, in Chicago, uh, a guy got up and read off for 35 minutes a list of everything in my life. And to me, it was very interesting because I'd not been aware of much of it. <laughs> Carrying on, uh, the proper reaction, of course, for me would have been to show some humility, to ask them, please, to keep it short. I had an improper reaction. I loved it. I <laughs> encouraged them. I scolded them when they left out any obscure fact. <laughs> And uh, so by the time I got to the very last stop on this book tour was in Stamford, Connecticut, the Irish American Society there. I was somewhat overly impressed with myself. And as I entered the front door, the first person I met was an elderly woman who rushed up to me, very nervous and excited, shook my hand vigorously, spent several minutes saying nice things about me. And then she said, uh, I don't live anywhere near here. I drove three and a half hours across the state of Connecticut to come here and to ask you, please, would you autograph my poster? And she handed me a pen and a poster with a photograph on it, and I said, I'd be very happy to autograph it, but before I do, I think I should tell you that I'm not Henry Kissinger. She said, you're not? She said, well, who are you anyway? <laughs> Told her, she said, why, that's just terrible. I drove three hours to meet a great man named Kisser, and all I've got is a nobody like you. I said, oh, I'm sorry you feel so bad. I wish there's something I could do to make you feel better. And after a few moments pause, she said, well, there is. And when I asked what it was, she leaned forward. I leaned forward. We were kind of in a conspiratorial crouch. And she said in a low voice, Nobody will ever know the difference. <laughs> said, Would you mind signing Henry Kissinger's name? <laughs> so I did. <laughs> and it's hanging today on her living room wall in Eastern Connecticut. The name that reminded me to listen with pleasure as I get these nice introductions like the one from Sherman. But don't take them too seriously. But you know, I, I did spend many years in the Senate. I entered initially by appointment, so I wasn't really very well known, and I, it was the greatest honor of my life to represent the people of Maine in the Senate. I'm asked often now uh, whether I miss it, and, and my answer is that I, I don't miss a lot of it, but I do miss parts of it, and one part that I miss is the opportunity to travel around Maine to meet and talk with and interact with uh, people who have the opportunity and the pleasure, as I did, to live my life in Maine. Uh, I grew up in Waterville, but once I got in the Senate, I found I was first surprised, but on reflection it's not a surprise, that I really hadn't been to many, many places in Maine. I suppose for most of you, you live in Maine, but you really haven't traveled every place in the state unless your job takes you there. And so it was an eye-opening experience for me to travel to every community in Maine. I spoke at the graduation of every single high school in Maine. That took me 14 years because they only they do it all in a couple of weekends uh, in June. Uh, and it was a marvelous experience. And, and one of the benefits of it was that there was a lot of humor involved, and uh, like the story I just told at the beginning, uh, it kind of kept me in my place. And I, I, I thought about it uh, just this week. I, this is the fourth town I've been in on the coast this week. I was in Brooksville 
Monday night, South Coast Harbor, Tuesday night, and final day than last night. And it got off to a good start in Brooksville. The event was held at a, in a working farm, in a large barn. It's really quite a nice place that I call the Folly Farm. And as I got there and started to go into the barn, a fellow standing by the door shook my hand and he, he, he said, Senator, you see that sign over there? And hanging out on a tree right in front of, at the front of the farm, just a few feet from the barn, is, is a, a sign that shows the products that you can buy at the farm. And there are only three words on it. Lamb, pork, manure. <laughs> So the guy says to me, he says, well, I guess we know which part of that menu you're going to provide tonight. <laughs> and I said, I said, that is smart Alex, like you all over me. <laughs> but it kind of reminded me of the story I used to tell years ago. When I started out, uh, I really wasn't very well known, and I tried to get around the state as much as I could. And so one occasion I was asked to come uh, to... Uh, couple of small towns in Central Maine, not far from Waterville. Uh, one of the towns had had a, uh, a local issue that they wanted to, to me to talk to the town council about, it. and I'll get to that in a moment. But So I spent a couple of days just going door to door to farms in the rural area, and it was really very pleasant. There were quite a few dairy farms there. One dairy farm I stopped at, uh, the farmer was really very gracious and hospitable, and then he was reluctant, but he finally screwed up his courage and said, I'd like to ask you for one thing. I said, what's that? He said, will you have a picture taken with my cows? <laughs> I said, well, you know, the art of politics is being able to make a fool of yourself gracefully. And I said, I've been asked to take pictures with dogs and cats, but this is the first time I've ever been asked to take pictures with cows. Can you tell me why? And it's really quite an interesting story. The government of Saudi Arabia had hired an American agricultural firm to help them upgrade the quality of their national dairy birds. Uh, and so this fellow from the U.S. had gone around the country and picked out prize cows, and two of them were from a farm in Sydney, Maine. And the farmer was proud of it, rightly so, and so I had my picture taken with these two prize cows. It then appeared on the front page of the local paper the next day. And on that day, I was still going to farms in the area. So I stopped at one farm. It's a very long driveway off the uh, main road. And uh, there was an elderly gentleman there who, when I knocked on the door, it didn't seem very hospitable. So to make small talk, I said, boy, I said, you've got a really long driveway here. And he said, yeah, well, if it was any shorter, we wouldn't reach the house. <laughs> seen your picture in the paper this morning with them two cows. <laughs> I said, what do you think about it? He said, well, I'm a Republican, he said, and I think we should keep the cows here and send you to Saudi Arabia. <laughs> you know, completely by chance, many years later, I did two tours of duty in the Middle East, and so I met with several kings of Saudi Arabia. And I had told them this story, and they kind of didn't get the <laughs> Well, anyway, it's really nice to be back uh, in Maine. Uh, as I said, I do live in, on Mondays, and I don't spend a lot of time traveling around the state, and it's very nice to be here again in Dallas, Scott, where I was. Uh, my last appearance here was a couple of years ago and uh, I'm always pleased to come to this very beautiful community and area. Um, I thought I would speak for not too long about some of the challenges facing our country and how I think we should deal with them. Uh, inevitably, uh, the subject matter is so broad that it would take a Senate filibuster to cover them all, and I don't want to subject you to that. So I clearly will not cover everything of interest to each of you, and that's why uh, I've been asked a lot half the time here to questions, answers, and so 
Uh, when we get to those, you can bring up any subject you want, ask any question you want, make any statement you want, uh, uh, and I'll be glad to try to respond to that. But let me now uh, discuss uh, uh, the state of our country. Uh, the United States is uh, by far uh, the dominant power in the world, and I believe will be uh, as far into the future as human beings can see. Our economy is the largest and the strongest by a huge margin. We have the most powerful military force ever assembled, certainly the greatest in modern history and arguably in all of human history. And yet, uh, tens of millions of our fellow Americans, including many here in our own state, are fearful, anxious, angry, feeling that somehow uh, they have been left behind and are not benefiting from the changes that are sweeping our country and the world. And there are changes. Now, I'll discuss some of them in a moment, but I want to say first that while it may appear counterintuitive on first impression that in the largest, strongest, and wealthiest country in the world there is so much satisfaction, in fact, it is a commonplace event throughout human history that whenever there is rapid and disorienting social change, it is accompanied by and generates fear, anxiety, and anger. Most historians have judged the Industrial Revolution to be one of the great turning points in all of human history. It began about 250 years ago in England as relatively simultaneously a number of machines were invented to replace men in the production of goods. There was widespread fear and anxiety then. There was violence and upheaval. There was some exploitation and much misery. But over the course of the century that delineates historically the Industrial Revolution, there was also the greatest increase in productivity in any society in human history up until that time. And as a result, the standard of living of the entire society of what we now know as the United Kingdom rose. And the principles of the Industrial Revolution then spread through what was then the developed world. And nowhere did they take root more firmly than in what was then the newly established United States of America, where a free and open society with new people, new ideas, new vision, with an emphasis on education, science and innovation moved to the forefront of nations in the world. We're now passing through a revolution that I believe future historians will judge to be as much a turning point as was the Industrial Revolution. It is the combination, the intersection and interaction of two major trends. First, technological change driven by scientific discovery, and second, what is called globalization, the increase in trade across national borders and the movement of people across national borders, compounded by a dramatic increase in the number of people in the world. Just think how each of your daily lives the daily rhythm of life of people throughout the country has been changed so much in just the past few years by the invention of a single device, the smartphone. Everybody here has at least one. Everybody here looks at it the first thing in the morning and the last thing at night, and depending upon how addicted you are, many times during the day. And it didn't exist just a few years ago. Just think about the depth and extent of scientific discovery about human life, the way in which the brain operates, the way in which our body functions, the capacity now to trace the genetic makeup of every living thing, including every human being. We benefit enormously from 
technological change and scientific discovery. But at the same time, we lose some things. Parts of our past, parts of our history, changes in our lives. I, I had children late in life, so I have two teenage children. My son is 19, just completed his freshman year in college, and I have a 16-year-old daughter who's a junior in high school. And I remember being struck by the fact that about a year ago, I went into the den of our home. Our son, my son had his earplugs in with his iPod, his computer was on and running, and the television was on. And I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm studying. <laughs> I thought to myself, I couldn't focus on any one of those things when I was his age, and now they, I guess, multitask. I'm not sure how depth of depth of knowledge goes now, but at least it covers just about everything. And despite much commentary to the contrary, I believe and I tell my children that they're going to live in a better world, in a better country, in a better place than I did in my long lifetime, because I believe that the trajectory of American history is upward and forward, despite the difficulties that we have. Now, so many of our fellow citizens, including many in our own state, are not beneficiaries of the changes that have occurred in recent years. Indeed, they feel themselves as victims. And they've been left behind by some of the changes, and they're angry and nostalgic about it. There's nothing new about that at all. They have been told through the political dialogue in our country that their <coughs> lost jobs are entirely the result of trade agreements. <clears throat> there can be no doubt that trade agreements in which we've entered into have caused lost jobs. But the benefits of trade for the American people have far outweighed the losses in the aggregate. And the reality, of course, is that most of the jobs lost in our history have nothing to do with trade agreements. They are the product of innovation, the invention of new products that cause the collapse of old industries. Just think about it here near the coast of Maine. Uh, there once was a thriving industry based along the coast of New England in which sea captains was crews numbering in the thousands in the aggregate scoured the world searching for whales to provide whale oil for the lighting that was used then. And when oil was discovered as a source of energy, literally the whaling industry ended overnight and thousands of men were left without employment. There was in New England, including Maine, a small but thriving industry in which Many men, and they were mostly men, were employed in the manufacture of stagecoaches and other horse-drawn carriages. No rational person would argue that our country's worse off because of the invention of the automobile. Millions of people now work at that. But for the men who lost their jobs when that industry disappeared, for their families, for their small towns, it was devastating. And they suffered on their own because they were on their own. How we deal with this challenge is to me the great domestic issue of the coming decades. Some say the answer is to build walls and to try to recreate a life that existed 50 or 100 years ago. The past always looks better through rose-colored glasses. But the real answer, of course, must be to move forward. We can't deny science. We can't progress by refusing to accept realities, even though they, they may be hard on some of us. To me, the only answer is to try to figure out a way to continue to advance science, knowledge, innovation, new products, new services, new ideas, but also at the same time to have a 
national unity and national purpose in making certain that those who are the victims of change are not on their own, through no fault of their own, and that they have the help needed to provide care, education, and most importantly, the acquisition of skills that are relevant to the 21st century, that aren't grounded in the products and services and industries of the 20th century. And the other thing we have to do is, and here's where the benefits and losses are most clear, one result of the dramatic changes that we have gone through in the past half century have been the most spectacular increase in wealth in all of the industry. <coughs> but that wealth is increasingly concentrated in a relatively few hands and not distributed throughout the full society. So many, many working people have seen, even though they've kept their jobs, have seen their wages stagnate, indeed decline in relative terms measured against even the modest rate of inflation that we have now. Somehow we have to make it possible for all boats to rise with the incoming tide. And we have to be able to adapt to the changes that are occurring and have people skilled to be employed in the 21st century. Now, that leads me, and I just want to use one example. One of the fastest growing job creating segments of the American economy, still modest but growing, is in clean energy. You don't have to have a degree from MIT to know that in this century, our society and virtually all others on earth will shift their economies from being carbon based to being either carbon free or carbon reduced. It is inevitable. Economic forces are at work that make it impossible to resist that. So the question is, do we try to resist it or do we try to harness it to our benefit? I believe the President's decision to withdraw from the Paris Accords could prove to be an historic mistake for our country. I say could be because the mechanism is such that it might still be reversed uh, by this administration or the next. But the fact of the matter is, 195 countries in the world agree, and three disagree. Nicaragua, Syria, and the United States. And the fact of the matter also is that we are, in effect, handing to China the opportunity to lead in the clean energy sector, which will become as large a sector of every national economy, probably not within my lifetime, but in the lifetime of some in this room, as carbon fuels are now. And so I, I believe that we have to look to the future to accept the scientific reality. It, it, it is I have to say this, no, nothing short of shocking that the President of the United States, the head of the Environmental Agency, the Chairman of the Committee on the Environment and the Congress say that climate change is a hoax perpetrated by the Chinese on the American people when the scientific evidence to the contrary is overwhelming. They can't possibly believe what they're saying because it is so obviously untrue. And how we can, how we think we can possibly move forward as a society by denying science. Now, there is a legitimate debate to be had, which we should have, on what is the best way to deal with the change. How can we most efficiently adapt to the changes that will be required by the warming of the Earth? That is undoubtedly a valid area of debate. But deny, to deny the very existence of it, to not accept scientific conclusions, is in my judgment deeply contrary to the interests of our country uh, and our people. Uh, let me close this 
part of my filibuster with, uh, with comments on one other subject uh, that uh, uh, has been much in the news and I think also deserves uh, a national debate of the type I've described, and that's the subject of immigration. It's become extremely uh, emotional, uh, and I want to say a few words about it, uh, I hope in not too emotional a way. First, as with the subject I just discussed, there is nothing new about the debate that's now occurring. From the very beginning, going back 15,000 years ago, there were no human beings in North America. What we call the Native Americans emigrated here from Central Asia across the land bridge that then connected Alaska to Asia. 500 years ago, and, and, and the Native Americans spread across all of North, Central, and South America in the course of that 15,000 years. 500 years ago, the Europeans came. And from the very beginning, the British, the French, the Dutch, and the Spanish fought among themselves and with the Native Americans for control of North America, a struggle which lasted over two centuries. And in the course of that struggle, there was demonization and stereotyping, <laughs> hostility to and fear of anyone who was other, different in some way. Everybody here has heard the term Wall Street. Wall Street is, in fact, a rather small street. Many of you will have been there, narrow and short a short distance from the southern tip of the island of Manhattan. And it was on that southern tip that the Dutch established the first European settlement, New Amsterdam. And Wall Street was the northernmost boundary of the small Dutch settlement. Fearful of those who they regarded as hostile and different, the Dutch built a wall there to protect themselves from those they feared. Most people, most Americans think it was the Native Americans, but in fact it was the English, who had about the same time settled in Massachusetts and were working their way south. And as we all know, the Dutch had a lot to fear because they ended up being taken over by the English and what was New Amsterdam is now New York. When our country was created, about a third of then colonists opposed the revolution and favored continued British rule. So when the revolutionaries prevailed, many left. And already, the already small population was even less and we needed to fill a very large continent. So we opened the doors to everyone. We had open immigration for about 100 years. The first restrictive immigration law was enacted in 1882. Nowadays, members of Congress have developed a political skill at writing fancy titles on bills introduced. The title often not only doesn't describe what's in the bill, sometimes it's the opposite of what really is in the bill, but it makes the bills politically more palatable. Back then, they were more direct, so the first restrictive law was titled the Chinese Exclusion Act. There wasn't much doubt about its purpose. It was a reaction to the entry of many Chinese laborers to build the Transcontinental Railroad. There followed a series of restrictive acts. In 1906, San Francisco was devastated by earthquakes and fires. The city officials struggling to deal with it had to try to figure out how to get schools up and running and one of them hit upon the idea of not only opening temporary schools, but reducing the school population. And so they passed an ordinance prohibiting any child of Japanese ancestry, even those born in the United States, from entering the public schools. They were forced to go to a segregated Asian school and to demonstrate just how universal racism really is. 
the Japanese were angry at being excluded from the public schools, and they were even more angry at having to go to school with the Koreans and Chinese, who they regarded as their inferiors. And then every group that's ever come has been demonized. The African Americans, of course, are the only group who came to America involuntarily, were kept in slavery for 200 years, and then suffered from hundreds of years of discrimination. Here in Maine, there was a very strong movement against Irish immigrants. Maine newspapers and magazines published pictures of cartoons showing a human face on the body of an ape depicting Irish as subhuman. And in Boston and New York, there were signs all over that read, Irish need not apply. Every Italian American knows how they were stigmatized, stereotyped, because there were some who were mafia criminals, and therefore people assumed that they all were mafia criminals. And every group that's ever come has been subject to that. We remember the Ku Klux Klan mostly because of their violence against African Americans in the South in the late 19th century, but in fact the Klan reached its peak in the North, politically including in Maine and in Indiana, in political contests in the, 19, in the 20th century, in the 1920s, with a virulent campaign of hostility against Catholics and Jews. And no group in America has suffered discrimination longer and more pervasive than have American Jews. Every person in this room is old enough to recall when Jews weren't permitted in country clubs and social clubs and apartment buildings in big cities. So it's a long history. And we, we are an imperfect society because all human beings are imperfect and all human institutions are imperfect. But the greatness of our country is that we have demonstrated the capacity to confront error to deal with it, to change, to improve. And so we've come through all of these crises, these and many others are better, stronger, more free, more open, more diverse country. That's the reality of American life, that all of these groups, subject to tremendous hostility, fear, and in some cases violence, have survived and prospered. The earliest of them withstood hostility. Uh, they got their hands on the bottom ladder, the bottom rung of the ladder of success in American life, and they pulled themselves up. And their children stood on their shoulders and they went even further. And now every one of these groups has contributed a great deal to our society. Think about these facts. Last year, 2016, seven Americans received Nobel Prizes. Six of them were immigrants. The, arguably, the three most successful businesses in recent years here worldwide are Apple, Amazon, and Google, reflecting dynamic changes in our economy and technology. Apple was created by Steve Jobs, whose father was born in Syria. Amazon was created by Jeff Bezos, whose adoptive father was born in Cuba. Google was created in part by Sergey Brin, who himself was born in Russia. As you leave here and drive home today, ask yourself, I ask you to think about two rhetorical questions. Would we be a better country if they had not been admitted? And secondly, and most important, what are the chances you think that Steve Jobs would have created Apple had he lived his life in Syria? or Jeff Bezos in Cuba, or Sergey Brin in Russia. The reality is, of course, that genius knows no language, no race, no ethnicity. It can be found wherever there are human beings, but it flourishes where there is freedom and opportunity and openness to innovation, a willingness to change, a deep, deep commitment to science, to knowledge, and that describes America. That's why we have so many Nobel Prize winners. That's why, even though we now comprise only 5% of the world's population, 
Nine of the ten most successful business brands in the world are American, as are 15 of the top 20 universities in the world. 91% of all online searches in the world are conducted on American systems. 99% of smartphones in the world operate on American made systems. We are not in decline. We are not a country in carnage. We are the greatest nation that has ever existed, and we have a great future ahead of us, if we will but recognize it. We are not perfect, as I said. We have made so many mistakes, misjudgments in our history, as of all human beings. But when you get up in the morning and turn on your smartphone, and when you plug it in to charge it at night, you should accompany both events with an expression of gratitude for the privilege and the opportunity to be in America, to live in our country, to be able to benefit from all that we have received from a society that is imperfect, but still has promise for our people and for people around the world. Now, we know that one of the reasons we succeed is that we are a nation of ideals and values that are set forth in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, not easily summarized, but truly they include the sovereignty of the people, the primacy of individual liberty, our highest value, the rule of law applied equally to everyone, including the government itself, equality of rights and opportunity. We also know from the, our own daily lives that these remain aspirations. They're not reality of American life. Not every American child has the same chance to get ahead. But what we must do is to lift our actions to the level of our aspirations. Even though we know that we can't ever perfectly succeed on a mathematical basis to make sure that every child has the same chance if we devote ourselves to trying to make it possible for every child to have the same chance. We can be the kind of country that we're all so proud to be part of, despite all of the dysfunction, despite all of the negative news that we hear today. And I, whenever I give this talk, I get a lot of questions challenging my optimism, but I believe it, and I think we all ought to believe and act on it. So thank you all very much. It's a pleasure to be here. as I had every other school, high school in Maine. And uh, so I agreed, and I drove the next day about three and a half hours up to northern Maine, although it's a rural area, the consolidated schools, of course, so there's a lot of kids, about a thousand of them in the bleachers in the gym. In the middle of the gym with just two chairs and a microphone, the principal would get up and introduce me. And when I get up, I'd been to so many high schools that I knew that the attention span of high school students to me and my remarks had never reached one minute yet. <laughs> so I didn't give any talk. I just said, as I usually did, uh, anybody got a question? Happy to hear it. Anybody want to make a speech? I'm happy to hear that. To my amazement, a student got up uh, out of the bleachers uh, and uh, came across the gym toward me. He, that I've got a speech I'd like to give me a pile of papers under example where I knew trouble was coming. He put the papers down and he began reading the speech. 
And uh, I stood there next to him for a few minutes and waiting for him to end, and he didn't. So finally I sat down next to the principal. He was very mad. He said, Senator, he said, we called this assembly so the students could hear you. He said, we can hear that kid every day, and in fact, we do. <laughs> he said, you go up there and take the microphone away from him because you're a person of authority. I looked at the kid and I thought to myself, I don't know, but this kid may well have a lot of relatives of voting age. <laughs> so I said to the principal, look, in this building, you're the person of authority. You go up there. He wouldn't do it. So the kid read for the entire hour. The bell rang. Susan saw that, and I drove back. So since then, I have been so open about speeches, but now that I'm not running for office, if you want to ask a question, ask it. If you want to give a speech, give it. So you get your hand up back there, and then I'll take you next. Let me take you. Let me go ahead. Just you got to speak up because I only got one good ear. Uh, and I'd like to ask you about free press and press conferences. About what? Free press and press conferences. Yeah. Uh, President Trump has given one press conference in February. Um, there have been many conflicts with his press secretaries and their press conference. Uh, lately, there's no video allowed at press conferences, and the answers given by the uh, press conference secretaries have been, I don't know, I'll have to get back to you on that. Haven't spoken to anybody about that. That's been typical of the last few days. Could you talk about the consequences of, from your experience in the Senate of not having press conferences as they have been scheduled in the past, and what can be done to uh, fix that? Um. I think the policy being pursued by the administration in that regard is unwise and I, I believe will ultimately be counterproductive. Uh, I think the, an essential element of our society is openness. It doesn't mean the public has a right to be involved in every single discussion, but certainly has a right to be aware of of what is occurring. But when I was a Senate Majority Leader, I had a press conference every day that the Senate was in session. Now, I have to tell you, I sometimes regretted that, <laughs> and I had many tough days, but I did it because I felt it was my obligation. I don't think the President need to have an open press conference every day, but I think he should make himself available to the American people and the media uh, more openly and rightly than, than he has, and I think ultimately he will come, reach the conclusion that it is in his self-interest to do so if he, if he wants to make his case to the to the uh, uh, the broad American public. Uh, I think he has effectively used uh, social media, uh, something that really didn't exist in widely in prior presidencies, to his advantage. But even though he has a broad audience to that, it doesn't represent the full public. I think it's more those who tend to be the supporters. And I think he's wiser in a, in a diverse and pluralistic society like ours to make himself more available. Well, that's why I talked longer than I thought that time. Well, well, I, I, I apologize. I, I didn't realize I took the talk so long. That's what happens when you spend time in the Senate. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll be a little late in the next meeting and I'll extend that a little longer. So go ahead. Uh, thank you for sharing your insight and perspective. Uh, I guess I'm curious, what is your toughest negotiation do you consider your toughest negotiation so far? And what would you consider our greatest challenge uh, besides lobbyists? I mean? Yeah. Well, uh, I spent uh, six years as Senate Majority. And while there was no one toughest negotiation, the aggregate of it was, was very difficult. The founding fathers were 45 of them, all men, gathered in Philadelphia in 1787. And they had uh, two objectives. Uh, first was that 
They never, they had lived under a king and they did not ever want there to be an American king. And so their, their, their first objective was to establish a system in which power would be divided and that there would be a continuing tension among those uh, in our government intended to prevent any individual group or agency from achieving the total power which they badly chafed under uh, during the period uh, in which they were a colony of the British king. And to do that, uh, uh, they set up mechanisms that uh, make it tough to get things done. Uh, you know, the one commentator exaggerated to make a point by saying that uh, the, the, the surest way to prevent bad things from happening is to prevent anything from happening. <laughs> And the Senate is sort of a microcosm of that. It's very hard to get anything done in the Senate, not so difficult to block it. And so I spent six years uh, trying to unblock it. But I had a different approach than taking that. Uh, uh, when I was elected majority leader by the Democrats who were then in the majority, the first person I called was Bob Dole, who was the Republican leader in the Senate. And I went to see him in his office, and I said to him that he'd been there for nearly 30 years, I'd only been there a couple years. So I said, look, you know more about the Senate in your little finger than I'll ever know, but I do know this much. If the leaders don't trust each other, this place can't function. And so I, I said to him, I'm here to tell you how I intend to behave towards you, and to ask you to behave the same way toward me. I said, that's the way we do things in Maine, and that's the way I'd like to do things here. He was delighted. And I, I set forth nothing in writing, just orally, the basic standards of fairness, openness, transparency, decency. He was delighted. We shook hands and to this moment, never once has a harsh word ever passed between Bob Bill and me. We debated vigorously. We disagreed on most of the major bills that came before the Senate. Sometimes we were able to negotiate them to a successful compromise, and when we weren't, we get up and made our arguments. We didn't make it personal, and the Senate voted. Sometimes my view prevailed, sometimes his prevailed. That's what you need in a large, diverse country like ours. You, you, nobody can have it all of their way. No negotiation can succeed if one party says, I got to have 100% of what I want. It just can't happen. So for me, to me, that is the toughest of what's happening now. Uh, it, is, it, it saddens me because most of these men and women want to do what's right for the country. They have different understandings and definitions of what's right for the country, and they have to be willing to compromise. But our political system has evolved in a way that makes that, that equates compromise with weakness or lack of conviction, and equates rigidity with somehow with strength and deeper conviction. But in a country this big and growing, uh, increasingly diverse. You know, there are 320 million Americans now. In 36 years, by 2050, according to the Census Bureau, uh, there'll be 440 million Americans. Even much bigger, much more diverse. And that's going to take more, I think, openness and trust in the leadership to be able to function in a, in a reasonable way. Can, can okay. The, excuse me, the Lincoln Theater is going to need theater back. Oh, the Lincoln Theater wants a theater back. Ah, yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> oh, I'm not. Uh, Thanks for joining with us and thanking Senator Mitchell and joining us next door in the library for the book signing. Okay. I apologize. Thank you all. Very much.